Welcome to another Healthy Australia webinar. This morning, the subject is adverse childhood experiences. Adverse childhood experiences are traumatic events that can have negative lasting effects on health and well-being. They are known to be linked to negative health, social and economic outcomes and include exposure to neglect, abuse and household challenges, including domestic violence, a parent in prison or a parent with an addiction. Almost seven out of every 10 children will experience at least one adverse childhood experience. One in eight will experience at least four. Children exposed to four or more adverse childhood experiences um, are three times more likely to have lung disease, 14 times more likely to attempt suicide, and four and a half times more likely to suffer from depression, and 11 times more likely to use intravenous drugs. Um, ACEs lead to disruptive neurodevelopment, social, emotional, and cognitive impairment, adoption of high-risk behaviors, disability, and social problems, and early death. People exposed to six or more um, adverse childhood experiences can die 20 years too soon. The good news is we can prevent exposure to adverse childhood experiences, and we can develop local interagency strategies to support families, transcend the impacts of exposure. Before I introduce our panel, I would like to first pay my respects and acknowledge the land that I'm broadcasting this webinar from, which is the Gadigal land, the land of the Eora Nation. So for those guys who um, are on the audience, if you'd like to let us know what land you're on uh, in the chat, that would, be, that would be awesome. I pay my respect to elders, past, present and emerging. And I would also like to acknowledge all Aboriginal people in the audience today. So to the panel, um, so today we're lucky enough to have uh, five awesome people on the, on the panel. Um, we have Zoe Robinson, who's the New South Wales Advocate for Children and Young People, and she'll be focusing mainly on the, uh, on the voice of the child uh, for this session. We also have Ian Hickey, who is uh, from the Brain and Mind Institute, and he'll be focusing mainly on the brain science uh, of trauma. Julie Sturgis from the North Coast Primary Health Network, CEO there, and do some excellent work in collective impact in the North Coast. And her focus will be around how to commission in the primary care space. We're also lucky enough to have Michael McAfee here from Policy Link in the UK, who'll talk to us about the art of working collectively. And we have a former Premier of South Australia, Jay Wetherill, um, and now uh, the CEO of Thrive by Five, who will talk a little bit about how to mobilize um, a movement. So first, uh, before we go on to questions, I would like to just say to anybody, if you've got questions, there's a Q&A um, button at the bottom. If you slide your cursor down to the bottom, you'll see Q&A. If you put your, your questions in there, um, I'll scan the questions while we're having the conversation. And I'll, what I'll do is try and pull together the key themes to ask the panel as, as we go along. We will finish at 11, um, dead on. So I will manage that time so that um, yeah, we're able to, to leave at 11. We have a lot to go through, so I'll start with my questions. So my first question goes to Zoe. Zoe, hi, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm well. Uh, thank you for your time. So um, Zoe, what are the priorities for children and young people from, from their perspective? And how is the system as, as it currently is meeting those, those priorities? And how do you think the, the system is currently failing? So let me say two things. Let me also acknowledge I'm on Gadigal land today. And so I'd like to pay respects to elders and colleagues amongst us as well. And also I have two Kelpies who have been very silent all morning who seem to be active in the background. So if you hear barking, let me apologise for that. Uh, so look, we obviously spent our time, we've spoken to over 32,000 children and young people across New South Wales. Um, and a lot of things matter to them, but I wanted to focus on kind of the pressing issues that we've seen this year, particularly. So children and young people say to us, first and foremost, that they want to be heard. They want to have a seat at the table when we're talking about decisions that impact on their lives. And I think that's a really important thing when we're talking about locally designed solutions and collaboratives and how that works and how children and young people are actually included in that. Because if we're designing a system, if we're designing a community, if we're designing a health response, anything like that, they should be part of those conversations. Um, the other thing that they've said this year is obviously they really do want to be armed with peer-to-peer -peer support. So mental health is a big issue. We've seen that as not just a big issue this year, but it's been a rising issue across a number of years. And the Mission Australia survey certainly talked to that. And, you know, we've talked about anxiety, 
depression, uh, but mental health as a whole. And so for that, they've talked about being able to have peer-to-peer support. And children and young people want that because they want to be able to support their friends and they want to be able to support their families as well. Um, and they want to be able to do that early and they want to be able to do that without kind of the wait time that might be necessary. And that also leads to the continuum of care. So not just assuming that because you have an exam that you have and you've suffered from long-term depression, but just that you might be experiencing anxiety before the exam. So how do we help children and young people in those scenarios versus all the way up to the acute scenarios where you need to have different kind of care? Um, you know, they're very active in terms of the thinking about all the things that are going on in the world right now. They, they've talked about what their education system should look like and what they want to be involved in around that. They talk about how they want to respond and be a part of what we do in disaster and resilience and things like that and designing it. Uh, and they've also talked about things around juvenile justice and access and what the impact is on, um, you know, access to transport, if you can and can't access it, and then you get fines and how that can lead to all kinds of um, outcomes for people. And so there is a lot that children and young people can say, but I think right now the very key thing is that they've said very loudly, please have us be part of your decisions. When you're, when you're coming up with a response in our community, we want to be there. We want to have a seat at the table and we want to have a consistent voice and that we are really the ones that can make decisions that impact on our own lives and can help support our families and communities around us. Uh, so actually getting the, the voice of the child into anything, I guess, so particularly around service design or, or how services should respond, is that something the Office um, of the Advocate for Child and Youth can help agencies do? Absolutely. So we have it mandated in our Act. We have 12 young people who are appointed every year to sit on the Youth Advisory Council, but we can also recruit for particular needs. And what I would say is that most communities, most local councils, most services also have their own Youth Advisory Councils. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel uh, necessarily. This year, we've seen Youth Justice, as an example, point, appoint two young people to their executive group, which has meant that they've got a straight, you know, they've got a direct voice to the executive director of Youth Justice. We've had a number of people who've come to us when they're talking about designing cities and looking at health reform, where they've actually engaged with young people to sit at the table. And so that's been a wonderful thing that we've seen this year. One of the things that we did this year is have a young person meet with Dr. Kerry Chant regularly to ask questions. And so Dr. Kerry Chant answered questions that were coming from young people. And the questions that they had were different adults, but also the explanation needed to be different as well. So we help with that for sure um, and provide advice around it. But I would also say that a lot of communities have some amazing youth groups that already exist. Okay, I need to come have a good chat with you about that then. So. Absolutely. Okay, thanks, Zoe. Um, so I'm going to turn my attention now to Ian, um, Ian Hickey. Um, Ian, um, in, I guess in, lay, in layperson's terms, what is the science saying about adverse childhood experiences or trauma in children? How does it affect the brain and what can be done to help children recover from, from trauma? Just a small question. <laughs> I'm going to say, let's, let's just take the last 30 years of neuroscience in maybe three minutes. Okay, so. 30 years ago, a bit more, when I, when I was a medical student, there was a very fixed idea that the brain and its development was under genetic control that more or less ran to a fixed plan to give an adult brain with a set of cognitive and emotional resources. What really the insights are of the last 30 years of the neuroscience is actually how the brain encodes experience throughout a very long period of development, minus nine months, right through to your early 20s, for some young men, even longer, to actually develop the whole capacity and all the way along, how is the brain actually responding to the environment in which it finds itself and then encoding that experience? So in fact, you know, the modern kind of view of that is, is of a very active responsive brain, particularly in early years, particularly under the age of five and the extent to which it makes connections, it responds to environmental enhancements and every new experience, every productive thing that happens, every social interaction in particular, enhances that development cognitively and emotionally. And adverse experiences or restrictive environments therefore create great variation. They impact on that in a negative way, on the development of key systems, in stress arousal, in memory and recall, in cognitive structures in response to that. But that continues not just under the age of five, during the prepubertal years, goes through rapid transformations in the early post-adolescent years, then in mid-adolescence and into early adult life. A dynamic, ongoing process where the nature of that environment in a negative way may encode those experiences and therefore perpetuate those, particularly through those stress arousal, memory recall, cognitive structures, 
on an ongoing basis. And of course, remember your brain is really controlling the rest of your physiology. So in terms of inflammatory responses, immune responses, metabolic responses, risk to other disease, it's really the central organizing principle for that integrated physiology to actually run. So disturbed brain function will have a lot of physiological consequences elsewhere for health. But it also in its responsiveness responds to opportunity or to recovery. So it's not simply a matter of there's an injury at two years or five years. The point you made in the introduction, where there is repeated injury or persistence or no further opportunity, then you're likely to get stuck with that reduced capability. However, it's also a quite a positive story of recovery depending on the social circumstances. Brains don't exist in isolation within the body, but they don't exist in isolation within the world in which we actually enrich ourselves. And the brain and humans are fundamentally social animals. So brain science is directed towards social interaction, much of which is emotional rather than cognitive. So our intrinsic sets of responses to situations, fearfulness, connectedness, attachment, etc. So it's the emotional kind of bit that drives then the kind of thinking about stuff on an ongoing basis. So the social world, the richness of that, the emotional richness of that is both the problem, if you like, if there are problems within that close world, but it's also the solution on another set of ways. And that actually, therefore, the community in which you live, the small world architecture in which we are, that's what we're physiologically built for. So on the one hand, we now have a much better idea of the way in which neuroscience or the brain continuously encodes the environment and perpetuates those particular experiences, but also we have a much better idea of ways to influence recovery if that is provided with, with, with recuperative environments, with environments that have the right sets of emotional and co social connection characteristics, not just the right kind of cognitive characteristics, really the right kind of group characteristics to build group resilience rather than individual capability. So, so your message there is about so trauma isn't just a one-off thing that just happens to somebody and then you're stuck with it, but there's a, it's a message of hope and recovery um, and one around the community or the, or the social setting around that, that particular person. Well, so two things, one's on the prevention. I mean, some individual incidents are hard to prevent in a yeah. particular way, but preventing repeated trauma and ongoing persistent trauma, you know, is something we really need to focus on in earlier sets of environments where people are really in at risk environments over a long period. So your point earlier on about one versus four trauma, yeah. the persistence of that, you know, where we have the opportunity to intervene and reduce that probability, we need to, as a society. On the other hand, you know, we need to provide the kind of experiences, particularly when people are young, where they can recover from earlier experiences. Okay, great. Thank you, Ian. And, and I guess the danger sometimes talking about adverse childhood experiences is that it can be quite simplistic and doesn't really get to the complexity of the... Yeah, it, it, it's in danger of a certain kind of fixed nature, as genetics was in the past. Yeah. You know, a certain sort of determinism. It's yeah. happened. There is no recovery. Yeah. You know, particular events, you know, and that is just not the case. Yeah. But, but the accumulation of adversity and the accumulation of events obviously does decrease the capability over time. So in the preventive area, we can't prevent everything, but we certainly can intervene to reduce the degree of exposure in many, many situations. But also alongside that, actually promoting positive environments, social environments within families, within communities, within education that provide the enriched environments in these earlier phases is just important, just as important to think about how the brain then encodes that, how it encodes the positive experiences. Great. Thank you, Ian. Um, so I'm going to turn my attention to Julie. Hi, Julie. How are you? <laughs> I'm well, Eugene. Thank you. <laughs> um, so Julie, from a primary health network or primary health space um, and for you, what, what are the real world impacts of adverse childhood experiences or trauma? that are seen daily by GPs and other primary care practitioners. Yeah. So actually, I'll, I'll just start by acknowledging um, the traditional custodians. And I'm on Bundjalung country today for everyone that's on the call um, in lovely Ballina. Um, so look, you know, I think um, the real world experiences that we're seeing, and, you know, I, I guess I'm talking at a health system level here, it, it really reflects you know, I'm listening to Ian speak and it really reflects, you know, this, um, the things that he spoke about. And I suppose we've done a lot of work on the North Coast around trying to understand just from a system level, how this impacts on demand and what we see. And, you know, certainly what we know is um, 
that you know some of our biggest demand on the north coast particularly in our vulnerable communities um, is uh, around children presenting with problems that you know are highly recurrent and um, are really probably a reflection of um, other issues that make them present with those physical problems. And certainly when we look at um, our presentations, both to GPs and to emergency departments on the North Coast, in fact, you know, I don't know whether it's surprising to people on this call, but that zero to four age group is actually our highest presentation group. Um, and, you know, very high in GPs. So we really need GPs to understand, you know, not just the symptoms they're presenting with, but also the underlying causes of some of those symptoms, I suppose, which is a really important part of our work moving forward. But for GPs to also be connected to all of those other services in the system that will support that. Um, but, you know, what we do also know with families where there are high levels of trauma is that most um, present more often to EDs than they do to um, GPs. And so it takes a lot of work in our system with the LHDs to actually drive some of that as well. And, you know, some of those issues are that um, emergency departments particularly are focused on um, you know, one-off and emergency care rather than looking at the system that has to come behind that. So we're doing a lot of work with all of those service providers to try and really understand some of those root causes and how we actually pull that together in a more cohesive approach on the North Coast. Um, so a lot of that work now is about, um, you know, as Zoe said, pulling communities together and in particular involving um, families and people with young children in helping us design uh, some of what uh, that might look like. So, um, you know, I think collectively, I think we know that um, it is a really big issue for us. It has a really big impact on that. Some of the research that we've seen lately has shown that, you know, uh, educational attainment at age seven can be directly linked to the number of ED presentations a child has um, in their zero to four age range. So what we're seeing is, uh, you know, we can directly identify educational attainment to actually a cohort that we can identify because we know how many times they present. And particularly in the work we're doing about living long and healthy lives, we know that um, you know, your life expectancy, as you've already talked about, is completely related to you know, those factors as well. So um, I think it's a, you know, we're trying to take a much more of a system approach and a much more of a well-rounded community approach to what that looks like. Um, but certainly if we look at it from a system perspective and the investment we currently make, we make a big investment in dealing with the presentations that happen because of trauma, but not really looking at the root causes that we should be fixing to stop that. Yeah, yeah. And I know in, in your um, uh, Primary Health Network, you've done a lot of work around building collective um, uh, processes from a from you know a wide but also to local organisations and I mean I had some experience with Healthy Clarence for example and there's some interesting work going there interagency work it, is is that the approach that you're recommending for this space because I also know that you've done some mental health mapping with Ian and uh, looking at the you know what needs to be done to actually prevent suicide or improve mental health and well-being do you want to say a little bit about that. Yeah, look, you know, undoubtedly the work that we've done with Ian and the Mind and Brain Institute has been really pivotal in changing our approach to that. So certainly in the development of that complex and dynamic system modelling, which, you know, was based not only on a whole lot of service providers being involved, but a lot of um, community participants and people with lived experience and those sort of things, you know, coming back to what Ian said, the, you know, the single biggest intervention that we could introduce on the North Coast uh, was social connectedness. And I think, you know, it had, Ian, you might correct me, but, you know, it had the ability to, over time, reduce suicides, you know, by about 15%. So, you know, that sort of intervention actually outstripped any clinical service intervention that we could put in. Now, it's not saying that we aren't going to do both, but what it made us do is recognise the importance of bringing community and that social connectedness together um, and building those community groups. So it, it's a very big focus of where we're going with this. And obviously, collective impact is at the heart of that, how we bring those people together. And of course, Michael has been working with us on the North Coast as well about you know, driving our approach to collective impact as well. Yeah. Do, Ian, did you want to come in and say something? Yeah, I just want to say that 
one of these things, and while there's a great awareness around psychological processes and mental health impacts, there is a tendency to still see that as an individual cognitive or emotional or clinical response. Whereas, you know, to be mental healthy for life, you certainly need personal autonomy, but you need strong social connection. I mean, the challenges at the moment we have, the COVID-19 situation, the problems we've had with droughts, bushfires, floods, you know, the economic situation we face, impact on those social structures much more. So I think the great thing about Julie's work and the recognition in the North Coast PHN and the collective is on the way in which communities respond as a critical part of affecting outcomes like suicide, like mental health problems that we then you know, count at an individual level. But that social fabric is critical. And I think in Australia, we've always kind of understood that, but we don't necessarily invest in it in the way that actually delivers these kind of returns. Right, right. Thank you, Ian. Can I ask Ian to be controversial? Um, <laughs> do you think the, um, the recent Productivity uh, Commission report on mental health recognises all of those other determinants that go into achieving that then? That's why, having been partly responsible, that's why it was commissioned. <laughs> I think when it gets in, unfortunately, in terms of where it goes, it simply signals employment, housing, welfare, child development, it doesn't actually go very far with the what's to be done. I think this is now, you know, at a community level. So we know the cost of the way that we've been doing things. I think the issue is, I'm thinking the sort of communities like yours, Julie, how do we actually draw on the community's willingness regionally in Australia in these regions in which you live to make this real? So I'm glad to see in New South Wales, a movement towards decentralization to the regions just need to persuade Canberra that that's a really good idea too, through things like uh, Julie's primary health networks and the sort of things that Julie's leading with a population focus, a community focus. So I think Julie, um, the Productivity Commission idea is designed to do that. I think the actual doing now relies on the kind of initiatives that you're associated with. Great, thank you. Um, so now I'm gonna turn my attention to Michael. Hi Michael, how are you? Hope, hopefully it's not too late for you. You're on mute still, Michael. Hopefully it's not too late for you uh, in the US, so thank you for, for coming today. Um, Pleasure to be here. Um, so, so Michael, um, how, how in your own sort of experience can collective impact be used to bring agents and agencies together to deliver, to deliver positive change with community? And when does it work well and when does it not work well? Perfect. Well, I would say if you're looking at um, population level indicators um, around the, the health outcomes of children and their families, then you need a collective impact strategy if you're gonna have any chance of getting those indicators trending in the right direction. Um, small programmatic efforts won't be at the scale necessary often to move those indicators. And so when you're looking at population level data, the question should be who all is needed to get an indicator trending in the right direction because one individual or one institution will not most likely will most likely not do it i find that collective impact works best when you actually have institutions and their leaders actually committed to a result With, without really being committed to a result and really being fanatically focused on moving an indicator these things just become cute little initiatives yeah. <laughs> that you do for two or three years Nobody really owns anything. The work really becomes meeting yeah. and telling stories versus how do you change our cities? How do you change our systems and our policies so that they actually work for children and their families? Right. And so to me, that commitment around population level impact, that commitment from their institutions and leaders to expend some of their political capital to do the work that is necessary to improve lives that's when collective impact works. A real practical example would be collective impact like in our country, and we have a lot of issues with lead in the water in some cities because of old infrastructure. Collective impact is not needed if you're just gonna pass out the water bottles because you're actually not solving the brain damage that you're doing to those kids, the very thing that Ian and others are talking about here. You're still causing them to be poisoned. It may make you feel good, but it's charity at best. Collective impact is needed if you actually wanted to fix the piping so that those kids would never be poisoned again, right? And figuring out how would you pass a bond measure or something to finance that infrastructure change so that, and have it done so that the poor folks don't have to pay for it. 
Collective impact today is needed now more than ever to design our cities so that they actually work for those who are being left behind. If you're not doing that work, you're most likely doing charity work. I think charity work is fine. It's needed. Alleviating that immediate human need is needed, but it's rare that charity work will let you earn, will earn you the right to expect that an indicator will start trending in the right direction. And, and when I've, I've heard you speak on a number of occasions, Michael, and you, you talk about commitment to results and, um, and, and you very passionate when I've heard you talk about poverty and getting to the actual, the, the key or the root cause of the, the situation that keeps people out of being able to engage with the economy, their health or their social well-being. Um, and I, are you seeing a change now um, in the States or in Australia experience where we're actually becoming more serious about the root cause of the, the problem? I'm seeing us use the language yeah. that shows that we have a, a new consciousness. Yeah. We understand what should happen. So we've acquired the language. The work, the practice of not leaving people behind, designing a world that works for everyone, that is still the work for our generation, no matter what country I go to. Yeah. We're still, when we look around our countries, we're still leaving far too many people behind. In the United States, as an example, one in three people are economically insecure. 40 million people are facing evictions because of COVID-19. So it doesn't really matter what the language you use is because we're failing on those middle class people and below who um, are playing by the rules, doing everything right. But the design of our society is just too toxic for them. Hmm. And, and I see that all over the place. Now, what I've been inspired by when I come to Australia is that you all have a scale that is manageable. Um, you have institutional leadership and government that is committed to doing the work. And when I've been in community and on the ground, I see folks actually doing that from where I've seen innovations in the way you've designed your tenders to be more results-based, to where I've seen coalitions formed in community, to where I've seen you engage indigenous people in solving some of their own problems. These are all innovations that I've seen in your country. And in some cases, I've brought back and shared that work in my own country. Right. So I think in many cases, you are ahead of the United States, while it may not feel like it to you, <laughs> You are ahead of us in some instances in advancing collective impact because your governmental institutions get collective impact and what needs to happen. Great, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, and now to, to Jay. Hi, Jay, how are you? Hi. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your time. And, and, and Jay, um, I really wanted to, to um, sort of explore the movement that you're, you're leading at the moment, the Thrive by Five initiative, mm -hmm. because um, I, I sort of, jumped on board on this I think maybe about six weeks ago when you when you launched um, the, 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 the movement. Um, I, but within the context of, of why do you think there is need for reform um, in the policy agenda in the child education and development space? And why do you think that reform needs to take place now? Why is it important to take place right now? Yeah, well, for, for all the reasons, I should say that I come to you from uh, Wajak uh, country in the Noongar Nation. Um, uh, for all the reasons that have been advanced, um, the critical importance of the, the first five years and the trajectory of um, the life of a child, uh, their health, their learning, their behavioural, their wellbeing um, trajectory, all of, for all those reasons, um, we need to put essentially early childhood on the, the national political agenda. And what the gap between what we now know, as, as Ian's mentioned, that the brain science about how a child's brain develops and what we do is enormous. Like we don't conduct ourselves as though it's real um, because we wouldn't uh, allow families to have to navigate their way through very complex service systems. We wouldn't uh, allow them to have their access to those service systems very much determined by whether they could afford them. Uh, and they wouldn't, we wouldn't run them through the, the ringer of all these very complex places that they have to go to um, to actually get access to the services they support. So there's a, there's a whole range of, of problems with the service system. But it really emerges from a pretty fundamental uh, first order problem, and that's how we imagine early childhood. And, and the, the, this brain story is miraculous. Like, it, I mean... Ian has been talking about some of these 
you know, the, the way in which a child's brain developed. But I think, I think it's, people think they know that the first five years are important, but when they're actually exposed to the, to some of the information about the neuroscience of a child's brain development, I think they're staggered and they become, first that it, it, it causes them to think, my goodness, how do I, how do I uh, interact with children who are under five and that I'm associated with my own children or if they're grandparents, uh, their grandchildren. Um, but it also causes them to become very powerful advocates for changes to the system. So it does two things. It, it arms them with their own information, but it also causes them to be massive advocates for change. So uh, in, in a way, this isn't new, as, as Ian has mentioned, we've known about this for a long time. Um, and we've been putting these arguments in front of decision makers for a long time. And they've been you know, incremental improvements, but not dramatic improvements. So why now? And why has this got some hope for change? Well, I think what we, the sector, people that, that understand this intimately, are not strong enough by themselves to win this argument. That's been proved by experience. So what we have to do is build a broader coalition for change. And I think that it's not, it's, there's no natural reason why early childhood should be on the, the national political agenda, but it is at the moment, um, partly because COVID exposed the weaknesses in a range of service systems, but in particular in early childhood. So it's on the agenda. Uh, and I think that there are some other powerful coalitions that, that are building around it. So women um, in particular look at an early learning system that doesn't meet the needs of their children, but also doesn't meet their needs in terms of their participation in the workforce. Um, working families look at a system which is incredibly expensive, one of the most expensive systems of early learning in the world. It's not, and it doesn't really it's not really designed as a system of early learning, it's designed as an incident of employment policy. So the, these service systems that, that, that really involve themselves in the lives of children and families in the first five years, they're a mess, they're in need of reform, the, 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 the need for that reform has been exposed by the current circumstances. And I think that, you know, the, the, the whole COVID world is really, caused us to rethink what's important uh, and has also, in a, in a way, almost given us permission to think about big systems change. Because the challenges confronting us are so large, I think the day-to-day -day, um, has been put aside for a moment as we start to think about what does it take to rebuild a society from the ground up. And, and starting with children, I think, is a, a really important and excellent way to, to start. And you can build I think a, a community consensus around that. Yeah, and I, and I noticed that you've got significant um, support from both sides of um, the political spectrum, that it's a, a bipartisan approach. Is that something that you deliberately um, uh, chose to do? Yeah, the sort of model that we're trying to use is, is the, the model that led to the last really successful social reform, which was the NDIS. Now, all right, there are still some issues with NDIS, but it was a spectacular breakthrough. Mm -hmm. And what the what we were able to do with that campaign, every Australian counts, was to get a very large and disparate sector, but get them to all sing the same song essentially. And um, that that's the model that we're we're trying to use. And by the end of that campaign, we had 150 of the 150 federal MPs had all signed up to it. So it achieved that bipartisan support. Yeah. And I think there are prospects of achieving bipartisan support in a reform of this sort. But the, the key to it is the universal platform. Um, that we, there is no, I, I, my judgment is that, that politically there is no capacity for us to win an argument if, we, if the narrative is simply about disadvantage. Yeah. Um, of course, disadvantaged families need more but um, we also need to offer a universal offering because the truth is that some families that are struggling aren't necessarily um, all concentrated in low socioeconomic communities as well. So the universal platform is critical from a whole range of perspectives, but it's also crucial to have something that builds that broad coalition of support. Yeah, and when I talk to educators, they, they talk about, they, they notice when children or families are struggling, and they're, they're finding it difficult to know what to do in that space because they don't feel they have the capacity or the capability to 
really handle that particular situation. So often it gets it not not ignored, but the the it, the opportunity to intervene early is missed. Is that something that you you are hearing as well? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 so the childcare centre, which is obviously a very large and this for zero to five year, is a large touch point for many families. Um, they, they're much more than childminders. They, they, of course, they're, they're actually early educators. But even more than that, they, they involve themselves in the lives of families as well. Um, so, you know, this is a, we have a cohort and a, a service system on which we could build a fantastic yeah. uh, community resource that, that could um, link in all these other important services. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to... Oh, does someone want to say something? Yeah, Ian? Yeah, can I just comment about that? Because I think Jace has raised a really important issue. Um, during their uh, previous Prime Ministership, Malcolm Turnbull, the idea of transforming childcare to early childhood education as a formal policy to overcome disadvantage, pick up Jay's point, the early opportunities for early intervention are not simply located in low socioeconomic areas. There's a universality about that. And the concept we also got the Prime Minister Turnbull to take up of building the nation's mental wealth is for everybody to their own capacity. Interestingly, during the COVID period, we had a very short period there of universal childcare, which has now gone backwards again. So I think there is an issue right at the moment of really taking that forward, that it is the best way to pick up Jay's point across the board of maximising the opportunity for everybody where you are. But there's some really important underpinnings, you yeah. know, in the overcoming disadvantage. A lot of work's been done. I think the base is there in childcare settings, not just for economic productivity, but for the kind of social and cognitive development we're talking about. But it needs to be presented that way, very overtly by the sort of discourse that uh, Jay was just making. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Um, I'm going to go to some, some great questions that we've got uh, from, from the audience. Um, and if you want to answer the question, just put your hand up and I'll, I'll go directly to you. If nobody puts a hand up, I'll make an attempt to answer the question. Um, uh, and I'm the least expert here. So, um, so what are, what, this is from Jessica Farrell. Um, what are some strategies to get parents involved in the recovery from ACEs or prolonged trauma when often the parents have their own mental health challenges and have been part of the cause of the child's suffering? I want to have a go at that. Oh my God, the worst nightmares just happened. <laughs> okay, Zoe. I'd like to also say, I think I'm the least qualified person on this panel, but I'm thrilled to still have the opportunity. So, I mean, I think there's been some good examples. So we've had in New South Wales, we have intensive therapy support where it's not, and we've all touched on it. You know, it is, it is a family response. And you do sometimes have to deal with the individuals in that family and the needs within that family, as well as the obviously children. So we have seen some investment around that. Um, I think the difficulty is, is, you know, when we're talking about true prevention, and I remember being in a meeting recently when someone talked about earlier prevention, I was like, we can't keep adding words in front of something, prevention is prevention, um, is, you know, if we haven't addressed the parent issue, <laughs> it is going to be incredibly difficult because we do have to spend the time doing both. And you have to do it as individuals within a family unit and then the individuals um, themselves and then the family unit. So I think there's, there's good examples of it. I, I think the difficulty is, and we've all talked about it, and there's been some great language around well-rounded communities and community willingness. You know, it does take a whole village around this stuff. And so actually you do need to be able to have the services lined up, the stability around that, um, and to get you know, we've talked a lot about health response, but there's a huge part in an education response. There's a huge part in education being able to identify the uniqueness of a child, but also the uniqueness of that family and what that need is. So there is some great work going on in New South Wales. It's just that I don't think that we've seen it go to scale. And I think you've still got to have people understand that there are community, there's cultural issues, there's community issues. And so you have to invest the time and perhaps our system right now with three-year contracting doesn't allow people to invest that longer time in community to work with families beyond that. Yeah, thank you, Zoe. I do want to mention that some of the work that's going on in, in, in the Primary Health Network up in the North Coast in Grafton is um, the, the piloting of something called a parent cafe, which is being brought over from the United States, which basically is to support parents to support each other. Um, and I think, you know, once parents get into a sort of program, it's easy for them to feel that they're broken and they're being taught how to be a parent. And it's really about not doing that and, and really empowering parents to be the support 
for for each other and that's sort of the approach that we're we're aiming to take um so um sue parker um oh, packer sorry um sue packer asks i i get concerned about the notion of the individual intense therapy for individual children who looking at the child's words this is especially in schools which are so often focused on the problem rather than helping the child enjoy school and enjoy learning and how to behave in ways that connect with others, uh, with other kids successfully, like sports scouts. Do you have any comments on how better to focus on social connectedness? So often these kids are so often these kids are seen as bad. Who wants to address that question? Yeah, could I have a crack at that? Because yeah. I, I was going to start off actually uh, after you frame the thing by um, talking about something that I learned through um, my work with Reggio Emilia, which is a school of pedagogy out of Northern Italy. And interestingly, they, after World War II, they literally rebuilt their community brick by brick by creating early learning centres. There was a big debate in the community about how we rebuilt post World War II. You know. And the women rebuilt it. Basically, there was a debate between the women and the men and the women rebuilt their communities based on early childhood and have now got and this was 70 years ago, before we even understood about the neuroscience. But the, the byline though for, for their work is in everything joy. And it, it's a very powerful idea that needs to be uh, held onto, I think, in all of, um, in all of our thoughts, because there is, there is a, um, um, you, can, you, can only, you can only really describe um, seeing a child playing as as joyful that that's what is is going on but something very profound is going on as ian would tell us that it's very complex uh, brain chemistry is is emerging as well at the same time as these multiple sensing pathways are all stimulated what's happening is these connections are being made and and this is the this is at the heart of you know healthy development so yeah. But it really does come down to that that basic idea of joyfulness and play. I, I love that statement in everything joy, and it, it reminds me of um, what play was like in the sixties and and what it's like now. And I just wonder whether we've curtailed that joy by putting safety around um, playful and play. I don't know if you've got a thought about that, Jay. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, I think you're seeing a bit of a movement back to that nature play movement where there are sort of places where you can, you know, get muddy and scuff your knee and have all those other sort of uh, fun experiences that, so I think there is an understanding that we might have sanitized things a bit much, but, but I think that that learning by doing, um, which, I mean, I, I used to be an education minister and I would say, I wish my high school was more like my primary schools and my primary schools were more like my kindergartens where there was this sort of learning by doing. Uh, because I think, you know, that that's the way, you know, when learning is happening, uh, because you see uh, a child lost in whatever the activity is that, that that's that's going on, they're just fully immersed, and that's when that's when learning is happening. Yeah. And um, it'd be wonderful if we if our system looked more like that. Eugene, I wonder if I could break in. Great to hear that uh, Jay was previously a education minister. I was talking to Jeff Gallup recently. He was previously an education minister in WA before he was a premier. I think many premiers wish they'd stayed with education. You know, the opportunity <laughs> society through education is large. But on the other hand, when you say risk management, a lot of things in education have become very narrow outcomes focused. And I would say the misuse of NAPLAN, for example, you must have this skill at this age as distinct from you want to encourage the, from a brain point of view, as many different experiences. You want to learn as many different languages. You want to meet as many different people. You want to have opportunities to explore. So I'm not sure it's the risk management bit, but a kind of narrowing of an idea of educational outcomes. I think one of the things we've seen during COVID is parents, everyone come to appreciate, schools is about social development. Yeah. School is about socialization. School is about mixing with others, about diversity, about learning to cope in a wider world. You know, yeah. uh, Many parents and grandparents have come to appreciate, you know, thank God they go to school. You know, And in fact, schools and educational environments are the principal social structure we have outside of families for actually providing that wider support. Unfortunately, I think we've become incredibly reliant on schools as the only formal structure that continues to operate. You know, we've seen during COVID, we're now saying we're really it's open because of childcare, because we need the essential workers and all sorts of other things. So the investment in the social support around schools and school communities 
is critical. But Jay's point about using the early childhood period and others as the opportunity for expansive, for diverse experiences socially, not just educationally, not just the hot housing of kids to pass certain kinds of entrance exams or be competent in a very narrow set of academic skills, which are very actually easy to teach. Mm. You can't replace the socialization and the other experiences very easily. And they need to be rich and they need to be diverse and they need to be complex. Great, thank you, Ian. I have, a, have another question here. Uh, again, so put your hand up if you want to um, address this question. It's from Robert Harris. Um, the vast majority of educators do not receive any information about the effects of childhood trauma on learning and behavior. Traumatized children are instead seen as lazy, difficult and badly behaved. School policies are rigid and inflexible and do not account for children coming to school with trauma. Is the approach of schools to trauma something that falls in the remit of the ACYP? Zoe, that's, a, that's directly to you, I think. Uh, so, I mean, within the capacity of noting the experts on this panel, yes. So what I would say is uh, the work that's going on in New South Wales, and I feel like I'm here um, heralding the work of New South Wales. We can have a different conversation offline for anyone who wants to, yeah. but, um, is the behaviour strategy that's happened right now looking at schools. And so that was directly informed by our Youth Advisory Council. They worked with education last year to come up with that. And that was one of the, the great things that has come out of that is the, um, that you no longer allowed to have suspensions in K-2, which, you know, we all probably have various views about that. Uh, and the reduction of how many day suspensions that can happen to that. What I would say, and I think we've sort of touched on it, is as... Um, Ian just said before is that we have kind of relied on schools to be the answers to so many things and the principals themselves in response to this have been saying that you know there's, sp there's specific skills that are needed to deal with particular complexities around children and young people. I echo the point that's been made in a number of um, chat questions on there is that you know the behaviour issues that you might see is not simply because of what's happened on that day. We need to be able to understand what's happened for that child and work with them over a lot you know understand where they've got to and I think there's been a shift in that but the reason the shift is happening is actually because the education department very kind of said well let's go work with children and young people to understand that and very bravely went into spaces where they were going to be told um, time and time again that this child had been suspended and the work that we've done in youth justice right now the key thing that children youth justice talk about is being suspended from schools so there is work from that the trauma stuff I think we're seeing you know, the investment around nurses, wind nurses in schools and different kind of councils in schools. I don't think we're there yet entirely, but it is something that we need to continue to work for. And I also think we need to have that balance of understanding, you know, the role of teachers and the role of the community of the school, and then also the role of people who are around that as well and how we can continue to invest in that and learn from it. Great. Thank you, Zoe. Um, I've got another question here from Jian, Jian Schmachter, who I met last week in Grafton. Hi, Jian. How are you? Um, in the education system, we have frequently observed children and families fall through the cracks, and their behaviours are often attributed to pathological causes. There is little professional development for pre-service teachers that touches on trauma, the brain, and how to support them. There is also a huge disconnect between early childhood education curriculum, social development, and play-based learning, and first years of school. Any suggested strategies? Well, that's a huge question. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know who wants to give that one a go. Can I, can I have a bit of a crack at that? Because I think it, I mean, this isn't directly an answer, but it's in the space. Um, we had a thinker in residence out in South Australia back in 2008 called Fraser Mustard, who was a neuroscientist and he gave us um, switched us on to the importance of the early years. And off the back of that, we, we built about a hundred of these child parent centers, which were all about trying to integrate services. But one of these key recommendations, which I don't think has been entirely acted upon, is this idea of a common, common knowledge base amongst the various practitioners that involve themselves in the lives of children. So whether it be social workers, teachers, uh, or early educators, uh, or nurses, that the, having a common knowledge base is, can be an important precondition to service collaboration. And it does seem to me that that doesn't exist at the moment. So this, um, I mean, there, 
there, there's some degree of this training is incorporated into the, the various qualifications, but I don't think there's a, a common knowledge base that allow us, allows us to more easily collaborate. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got 10 minutes left, and I'm going to go around to each of you for like a, maybe up to two, two minute response to, to final thoughts and final questions. Um, and, I, and I'm going to change the order just to keep you all on your toes a little bit. <laughs> um, so I'm going to first go to, to Julie. And Julie, um, I want to ask you, um, yeah, looking forward at the work that you're currently leading on um, in, in the North Coast, well, in five, ten years time, um, what, what would the primary health network perspective, what would success look like from, from your perspective in this space around um, adverse childhood experiences or early development, early childhood, that sort of naught to five space. You're on mute, sorry, Julie. Um, look, I think, you know, I'm gonna take um, Michael's tutorage in this and go, you know, we've got a really ambitious goal, right? And, um, you know, I think our, our work at the moment means that um, we developed a you know, already a very strong evidence base with the Mind and Brain Institute around what we know delivers outcomes. Um, and, you know, some of that, to Jay's point, is going to be about using that evidence um, and uh, trying to turn the system on its head a little bit around some of that work. And so that means that, you know, collectively, we will have many partners in that space, including education we've spoken about today, but our healthcare providers, and we're already doing work with education around how we can work more collectively together on that. Um, but, you know, certainly having the right governance arrangements in place too, so that we actually really formalise the contributions people make and we all hold our feet to the fire around the changes that we're looking for. And so, you know, uh, it means, continuing the work that we're doing right now, lobbying state government and lobbying the Commonwealth too around um, the changes we want to deliver as a collective on the North Coast um, and, and asking them to, to be flexible around the way that they support us um, as long as we're committed to those outcomes. Um, and it really is about focusing on outcomes, creating a joint vision, creating the vehicle to allow, allow us to work collectively and to be accountable for the way that we work collectively. So um, that sounds really simple in those four key yeah. points. But you know, as we've learnt, um, it's a bit of a journey. And and I do think we are gaining a lot of traction. And you know, one of the other things we're doing right now. So I'll give us a plug for our le our leadership for collective impact um, series tomorrow with Michael. Is um, you know, really building a groundswell of leadership, you know, from the top down, but from the bottom up so that people realise their role in that. And, and I suppose to Jay's point earlier, um, what's the narrative that we want to put out there that drives this commitment to this um, for, for the North Coast community? So all work that we're doing, but that, that's what we'd look like in hopefully less than five years, but at a five year mark. Um, but, you know, powerful partners are a part of, um, helping us achieve that as well. Great, thank you. And uh, thank you, Julie. And Michael, I, I, want to, I want to go, so you're on mute at the moment, Michael, but um, I just want to go to your, what, what drives you and the work that you're currently doing and your purpose and what, what's actually the, the key core driver for you and, and why, because I, I look at your work and I see how committed you are and how disciplined you are. What is the driver that really m motivates you? The driver that really motivates me is that um, our democracies have always been an experiment. And with each generation, we have an opportunity to continue to perfect them. Just so often, we just don't see ourselves as having the power to try to do that. Um, and I think you have to have at least try. And so for me, what it makes me hopeful, um, you spend your whole life wanting to have a career where you can make a difference. Um, so why start small? We can always go back to small. But I think when we think about our nations, they need, they need our radical imagination. They need our commitment. They need our institution building. And so for me, that 100 million number that I shared with you um, is what inspires me and motivates me. These are just everyday folks who need this democracy to work for them. Yeah. And we're getting inspired of 
all the challenges of the last four years, especially, we're still making tremendous progress. And so, and that's not coming because of folks with fancy titles. That's coming because of people on the ground. And if you just think about this past election, everyday folks in community saved this democracy. When folks with fancy titles wouldn't say this is wrong, when they wouldn't say racism was wrong, when they wouldn't say caging babies at the border was wrong, when they would say, wouldn't say not even wanting to give families $300 a month to survive through COVID-19 was wrong. It was community members, the very folks we leave behind that actually saved this, demo- this democracy with the power of their vote. Yeah. And so that's what keeps me inspired. Yeah. That democracies have always been about the people. And I want to stay aligned with them and to continue to create space for their voice to be heard and for them to transform our nation. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, Jay, looking at the movement that you're leading at the moment, and you're, you're, still, you're on mute as well at the moment, Jay, but looking at the movement that you're, you're leading and you're looking, you know, maybe five, 10 years from now, what's changed? What, what's been delivered through the movement? And, and in that, what would you be proud of most? Well, the, the, the whole of our society has reoriented itself uh, to you know the wonder of those first five years of life, and that uh, we we support families and children and parents uh, to make the decisions that they need to to allow those children to to thrive and prosper during those first five years. And I suppose what I imagine the service system would look like is that it creates the space for the very things that Michael's just been speaking about. Uh, every community would have a place. Uh, where children and families could go uh, to have their needs met uh, in those first five years. There'd there'd be a practitioner who was the bridge between the neuroscience and the parents. The parents could could see other good parenting model. They could get support with their special needs, with their children's special needs. If they needed to work, uh, that that there would be a place where those children could, could receive high quality early learning experiences. And this could become a hub. There'd be one of them in every community. It'd be connected in some way to to the education system so that uh, that system had a line of sight to these to the babies as soon as they were born, or even before they were born, as, as pregnant mothers pop in and and start using the, the, the supports and services. So that's what I hope the world looks like in 10 years' time. Yeah. Thank you. And, and if you to assist us in doing that, you can join the Thrive by Five website we have. behind me. We have, and everyone else, <laughs> please that join the Thrive by join the campaign. We did that on day one, uh, but more people that that join, then you know the, the bigger difference that we can make together. So uh, cheers, thank you, thank you, um, Ian. So when I first came to Australia back in two thousand and one, Ian was a household name back then, and now I sort of I know, and now I listen to the ABC and he's talking like he's making like mental health, psychiatry and neuroscience, like a normal thing, speaking and, and bringing it to the people. So for it, for, uh, and you're on mute at the moment, Ian, but for, from your perspective, 10 years from now, what's the sort of difference that you want to, you want to be, uh, participate in um, over the next 10 years? Well, to say something I didn't say earlier, the, the other big thing happening in neuroscience at the moment is the, is the understanding of individual variation. So while we're talking about in general what happens, what is, what is really clear is the variation of different ages in cognitive and emotional development is huge. So not all two-year-olds are the same, not all five-year-olds are the same. So what you're going to see is much better individual tracking of emotional development, cognitive development, and then for the services to be orientated about where that child and family are actually. So you don't get what's on average for a two-year-old or a five-year-old or a nine-year-old. You get what is actually likely to work for you and is that actually working for you being tracked in real time? This is partly a consequence of new technologies, but it's actually a, a point that Jay was alluding to earlier on. It's where the National Disability Insurance Scheme tried to go, but hasn't got there yet, mm-hmm. is to orientate the service around the individual needs and then to count the outcomes of that, to stop counting what we count in health and education, which is the activity, and actually count the outcome. But get it down to the level that people understand. Is my kid, is this kid in this school, in this community actually responding maximizing their potential or not. So not just cross-sectional averages all the time and average responses. The neuroscience and the developments of technology behind that and tracking that will, will progress. And the challenge will be, is society quick enough, as Michael's alluded to, to respond to what we know, to actually utilize that. So I'm, you know, I remain rather hopeful, 
maybe there's an ABC the audience listening, maybe not. <laughs> and 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 I want to end with the voice of the child. So I'm going to come to Zoe and and Zoe. Um, so you're on mute too at the moment, but Zoe, uh, from your end, you know, five, ten years from now, how would the voice of the child be sort of um, re-represented in, in the work that we're talking about today? I was hopeful that you were referring to me as the young person that in it, so I sort of, sort of. Sort of, <laughs> but no. <laughs> um, well, I mean, ideally, uh, you know, the commissioners and guardians, and I don't know if any of them are on the line, would be, it would be great to have someone who was a young person in my seat someone who was 24, so someone who is at decision-making levels who can really start to affect that. I, I love the fact that everyone's talked about ambitious, radical, you know, let's, let's do it, let's um, swing for that, that you're designing a service system that is meeting the needs of that person, not the average. I mean, that is an, a profound thing to want to be able to drive in that. So for me, it would be that children and young people have seats at the table, that we're really seeing them being involved early and often that we are really making funding decisions and strategy decisions and policy decisions that mean that we are looking at true prevention and true intervention and that we're not just waiting for people to fall off a cliff and then we try and do something then i think and incorporating the fact that we are talking about children as individuals as well as also part of a family unit so designing something that means that we're meeting their needs but ideally the next time we do this in 10 years time you'll probably have a 24 year old advocate sitting in this seat answering these questions and that to me would be a great victory you're not 24. Okay. No. <laughs> Very um, kind of you though. You <laughs> it's 11.01, so I've gone past it by, by a minute. I want to thank everyone um, on the panel because everyone uh, agreed to do this, uh, um, this um, session at no cost. Um, so I wanted to thank you all for your time and for contributing. I feel we've only sketched part of the, of, of the topic matter, um, but hopefully you've enjoyed the conversation. And hopefully the audience has enjoyed the conversation. And I will be posting this on YouTube um, today, so it'll be available for, for everyone to, to rewatch. So thank you very much, everybody. Have a great day. Bye, thank guys. you. Bye.